Giuseppe has a background in chemical engineering from the University of Palermo and a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Sheffield. He joined the Institute for Bioengineering of Catalonia in 2019 as an ICREA research professor. He's also affiliated with the University College London in UK, where he holds the chair in molecular bionics in the Department of Chemistry. Prior to UCL, he held several positions, from lecturer to professor at the University of Sheffield, first in the Department of Material and Science Engineering until 2009, and then in the Department of Biomedical Science until 2013. Among many awards and recognitions, Giuseppe was awarded an ERC starting grant in 2011 and an ERC consolidator one in 2018. He's also the founder and director of two UCL spin-outs, Somacer and Somanautics. So, we are looking very much forward to this seminar and we thank you, Giuseppe, for being here today. So, please, Giuseppe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Teresa, for the kind in the introductions uh, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. I think last time I gave a, a seminar to the all IBEC community, it was a few years ago when we were starting talking about me joining the IBEC. So uh, finally, I can give you a talk where I do use my IBEC affiliation. Although, as you can see, I, I'm collecting more sponsors than a Formula One car because, uh, unfortunately, I'm in the middle of the probably the slowest move ever, uh, move ever because I'm still in, in two cities between London and Barcelona. Actually, at the moment, I'm talking to you from London because, uh, of course, all the COVID and pandemic uh, consequence of travel has stopped me here in, in the UK. So, my group is very interested in bionics. Um, for some of you that don't know what bionics means, is the very established discipline in medicine where the intent is to create surrogate of the malfunctioning part of the body in order to replace them and potentially augmenting them and this is a very uh, rich field where electronics mechanical engineering material science are really converging into proposing very interesting solution um, in my case i'm interested in doing the same but bringing down to the molecular level and looking at uh, cells and biological entities at that level, you found some very uh, beautiful example of, uh, uh, of engineering, molecular engineering in this case, where molecules are moved very selectively, where objects are delivered very effectively. And so it becomes quite obvious that there is a lot of inspiration that we can take in order to present new solutions still, again, in, in the clinical world. Um, as such, my group is very much split into three disciplines. We have uh, one for physics, one for chemists, one for biology working together, in, uh, as I say, in two cities. Uh, one uh, quite large part of my group still is in London uh, at the Department of Chemistry, University College London. We're really much in the city centre of London, literally five minutes walk from the British Museum, if you've ever been to London. And then now, since last year, we also started our activity at the EBEC, uh, and here we go about five people now, uh, all, folk, all uh, right now in the, in the park scientific in the cluster building, uh, split into two labs, although only one is right now is uh, fully functioning. Um, so my group activities are split into four areas and that is, makes my life easier when I introduce them. And what I'm gonna do here now to start with is really give a very, very quick overview of uh, some of those, uh, really skipping over details, but because this talk is being recorded, you can always go back to the YouTube registration and looking at details and get in touch if you need to know more, et cetera. I think for the sake of it, I'm gonna go very quickly in the first few slides and then I will focus most of my talk on one topic in particular, which I really like to share with you. Um, so we mix chemistry and physics in our labs to really uh, copycat biological structure and as such we, we exploit a soft interaction particularly we try to make uh, from molecules polymers or macromolecules and then using those macromolecules for self-assemble much more complex and uh, sophisticated materials uh, so on one side we learn how to make polymers and macromolecules and we collect a really large repertoire of chemistries and chemical protocols to make them and uh, then we really are keen on putting these molecules in, uh, into much more complex arrangement. Uh, generally talking, we make mesoscopic materials, so materials which 
which final property is very much dictated by the molecular arrangement, and we have collected a few examples of those. And probably the lion's share of this mesoscopy material are more dispersed units, uh, which we like them for them, using them for drug delivery application. One of the most uh, study system in my lab are vesicles. And in particular, we work with vesicles formed by block copolymers, and, and as such, they're called polymersomes. Uh, here we really been since my PhD days. I've been studying them for uh, to understand how they form, what are the best way to make them, and of course uh, how we can control uh, their surface topology, their surface symmetry, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we again collected a really large repertoires so, uh, of tools and, and and very fundamental physics as well to understand how this works. Um, one very major. Uh, uh, limitation we apply to our design when we mix chemistry this is really to make sure that whatever we do and whatever materials we end up with it has a very strong potential to end up into the clinic and as such both at the chemistry level and the physics level we make sure that our materials has a, a, a very uh, it starts from a safe uh, possibility so as such we when we make polymers we normally take materials that are either already in our metabolic uh, metabolome. So basically, they are they are already expressed and me metabolized in our body, or they already been tested for many years by pharmacist and pharmaceutical, uh, and so they are classified as a grass, so generally recognized as materials. As such, we we, we combine them into polymer. Then our functionality becomes uh, very much a, a polymer chemistry exercise, and more important, a self assembling exercise. And then eventually, once the function is uh, is uh, asserted that then our materials degrade and become again metabolized or materials which our body can really take. And, and so that is a critical element in whatever design we do and to most religiously we impose this into anything from chemistry to physics. Now, as we learn how to study soft materials and nanomaterials, inevitably a critical element in our research activity is microscopy. We are quite active both in optical and electron microscopy. Uh, however, our uh, interface and our sort of cutting edge efforts are very much focused on pushing both techniques into time resolution. So really getting them to capture really fast dynamic process. Uh, so in, in optical microscopy, for example, we're really keen into push both the post and doing uh, analysis uh, uh, processing to capture things like a very fast traffic in event in light cells or membrane dynamics. And then all the way down to capturing the full brain dynamics of a single nanoparticle. And uh, for example, uh, right now, Ian Williams, a member in my group in Barcelona, is building up a very fast light sheet microscope to do exactly that. Um, since very much the beginning of my PhD, most of our materials are studied by electron microscopes. The electron microscopy allow you really a sub nanometer resolution. But one of the limitations when it comes to soft material and biologicals, as you might have heard, is that you need to have a dry or a frozen state. And so that means that you lose completely any type of dynamic information. So five years ago, we started building a new microscope in London that actually, I'm glad to share the news that, that a similar microscope will be built in Barcelona in the coming years. And, uh, and here, what we allow, what, what the system allows is to really capture the, now the structure of this material in the liquid state. And that, that really gives an extra dimension to the system that we exploit for, for example, capturing granular dynamics and transforming those into information about the conformational state when it comes to protein, or even really, really uh, have a look at the full three dimensional uh, space of the materials. And then that, of course, can be combined with traditional electron microscopy technique like energy filter or, or stem, etc. Uh, now, Alongside these uh, most of the physical effort, the chemistry also participate in microscopy in the form of generating probes. This is mostly done in collaboration with, uh, with different groups in the, in the last five years or so, well, actually more than that, 10, 10 no years, 10 so years, now 12 years, uh, we, we've been uh, working with inorganic chemists. They gave us some very beautiful molecules that work as a probe in both fluorescence, so they're very good at emitting light once excited but also have a metal core. So that means that they're also visible on the TM. This is really creating some very beautiful uh, opportunity in imaging, both at the cellular level as well as the material side. Now, as we move on from microscopy, uh, of course, more into the physics, and here, of course, is where we really try to tackle fundamental questions. And we're really obsessed with transport in our group, in particular, so you will see uh, later on as I show you application why we saw. 
And uh, we are really keen in understanding how biological transport works at different scales, and uh, in particular with a strong focus on cells, so cell trafficking. And then a very important element in our group is really understanding multivalent interaction. And for that, I will focus most of my talk. Uh, so I will not say much here. Uh, as for biological transport, of course, um, the traditional diffusion and fluid dynamics are any, a big interest in our activities, particularly with a strong focus on nanomaterials and nanoparticles diffuse and move in, in those environments. Uh, more sort of uh, at, the, at, the ver at the interface between uh, traditional transport phenomena and chemical interaction, the tools are really nicely combined into studying process like diffusophoresis, osmophoresis, where the flow of matter is controlled by chemical interaction. And a great example of this actually probably was given a few weeks ago by Samuel, uh, also another member of the IBEC, where they use these, uh, these phenomena and process to create systems that active. So they actually transform chemical gradient into both mechanical movement as well as uh, some very long range of targeting because uh, you have to effectively make the system chemo tactics or following a chemical gradient. Two years ago, we published a very a good example of that using our synthetic vesicles. And now more recently, we are interested also in to apply the same principle into studying a uh, biological entity for that. Um, then cell trafficking has been a very important area in our group. We're really keen on understanding endocytosis and how material enters cells. And of course, as a consequence of that, how the material then is processed into the cell, so it's trafficked across the different organelles. And in some special case, which I hope I'm going to uh, get today, also how this material is transported across cells, and that is very important. I already mentioned super multivalent interaction. Again, here is something that I will spend more, more work later on, but really at the end of the day, the reason we do science is always to do, to, to present some solution. And the fact that you suffer as an engineer in your life uh, as a scientist, inevitably that uh, uh, tendency is never really lost. And as an engineer, of course, you want to really come up with some sort of product, some sort of things that he really comes into solving a day, uh, so everyday uh, life problems. And our general sense is really to focus on clinical application, in particular in delivering drugs into the body. So we work with uh, neurology, we work with oncology, we work with immunology. And of course, uh, our proposed uh, molecular engineering solution can come up with some very unique enabling features. One of probably the most studies in my lab is intracellular delivery, whereas actually almost 15 years ago now, we showed that um, we can create a system that really can be taken up by cells, but most importantly, once into cells and reach the endosomal compartment of cell where the cells really uh, digest and process materials, then it responds to that environment, typically an acidic environment, and disassemble very quickly. And that disassemble process, this assembly process is then associated with a huge increase of osmotic pressure and the consequently osmolysis of the endosomal membrane and escape into the cytosol. This has been very nicely an effective way to get a lot of material inside, so we can use that for gene therapy, for antibody therapy, and more recently even to screen drug intracellular, and that is actually very interesting how things change in terms of results. Um, the, the multivalence design is something that, again, I will focus most of my talk, but in a, in, as a sort of introduction, this will allow a very effective way to create personalized medicines, to really create systems that really go from patient to patient. Then we apply those in neurology. In neurology, we're quite obsessed in particular with the blood brain virus. We have done a lot of work in understanding how this works and how materials transported across, and then use the information to present solution for stroke as well as uh, Alzheimer. And then in collaboration with oncology, also a lot of uh, our effort goes into glioma. But in cancer, we've also been working in melanoma, GI, cancer, the neck, et cetera. And then alongside that, you, any, whenever you work with nanomedicine, you have to deal with the immune system. Sometimes you cannot defeat it, so you need to join it. And then in that case, we learn how to actually implement some solution immunology. And so, for example, intracellular delivery and targeting macrophage means that we can now, for example, treat things like inflammation, rheumatoid arthritis is not immune disorders, or even present the antigen in a more effective way, so to create a more, more, more much stronger vaccine. And more recently, uh, Loris Vicello, which is another member of the IBEC, has uh, been taking the lead in, in, in studying a uh, potential application for intracellular pathogens 
the most famous being the tuberculosis, the macro, uh, the microbacteria tuberculosis, uh, and but that that concept can be applied to anything, including viral infection. And where we really, by targeting uh, immune cells, which are infected mainly by those intracellular pathogens, then you can end up, you can really put, pro propose some new way of uh, treating infection. Now, so I, I I do apologize to be really fast going through a lot of years and data and people's hours of work. But like I said, I think that the, the beauty of recording this is that you can always wind up later. But now I'm going to slow down the pace because I really want to talk about one particular problem that is really attracting a lot of interest. And that, of course, is the fundamental question when it comes to delivery. How do we achieve precision delivery? How do we get our drug exactly in the place where it's needed, potentially avoiding any other part of the body? Now, this is a critical effort when it comes to cancer, because in most of the time, cancer therapy involves killing cells. So you don't really want to kill cells which are not cancerous. And as you know, many anti-cancer therapy actually suffer of that problem. Chemotherapy is one of them. The most famous one is really effectively delivering some toxic materials into cells. And indeed, chemotherapy, sometimes the side effects are much worse than the cure. Um, the same applies to many other therapies. How we can get the stuff in there, that is our fundamental question. Now, Typically in medicine, what you do, you identify the so-called biomarker, something which is associated with disease. Again, if we stick with cancer, here, for example, I'll show you a, a section of a, a mouse brain, uh, which, which was uh, uh, modified genetically to express a specific type of glioma. And then we stain for a protein called LRP1. I'll come back to this protein later. What I want to show you this is the brown coloring of this section show how the protein is distributed across the, the, the tissue. And yes, there is an overexpression in the in, in the in the damage area, which is here the glioma, but also you find LRP1 in every where else in the brain. Now, the normal approach is, of course, this becomes a marker of the cancer, and inevitably it can be transformed into a chemical discovery, a drug discovery effort where you really identify a ligand, a drug that targets these proteins and potentially change its function in the, with the highest energy possible. Now, this, this concept is very much as old as, uh, even older than chemistry, actually goes back to the, uh, the 19th century, where when Paul Herrich, uh, a chemist doctor, uh, a German chemist doctor, actually came up with the idea of ligand receptor with the side chain theories. In other words, uh, the possibility of creating and controlling biological interaction by using chemistry and, and in a sense how affinity is defined is actually based on that type of interaction. It's quite interesting because actually Paul Herrich was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1908 which is three years later, the Einstein Annus Mirabilis, which is the, the years when Einstein published his most famous paper. And one of them, the Brownian motion, is was one of the very final uh, demonstration the molecule exists. So by then, when Paul Erich was postulating about chemical affinity, the concept of molecule was not set in stone yet. And actually scientists were arguing where the molecules existed. And that is a, a, a good, a, uh, testimony how uh, pioneering uh, Polarich was. Now, nowadays, this concept of ligand receptor is really much textbook biochemistry or drug chemistry or uh, medicinal chemistry. And we know that when a uh, ligands interact with the receptor, you form a complexes and the energy of binding can be really simply calculated using a chemical reaction equilibrium, right? <clears throat> now, I want to complicate a little bit your life and show what happens when we increase the number of entities during this process. So for example, instead of having one receptor, we have a, a membrane presenting, let's say, N, N receptor here, I'm showing three, then our ligand has a possibility to bind with all of them. So effectively, not only I end up with one complex, I end up with actually three possible outputs. So by increasing the number of receptors, I'm now in increasing the number of output, which means effectively I'm increasing uh, the energy of binding because I'm increasing the entropy at the bound state. And now if I show this mathematically, it means that the final energy is no longer the, the affinity, the association constant is also a proportional to the number of receptors there. Now, these things get a little bit more complicated when the ligand is also multivalent, because now the, 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 the final outputs are even higher in numbers. The entropy at the bound state increases even more. 
And of course, that really much depends how this multivalence is present. In other words, whether the feather, the point to, the, the joint together ligands is long or short. In other words, where the, when you have the, the first binding, can you still do other binding, et cetera. And depending on that, what is called a ligand topology, then you can end up with a nine, for example. So three binding with three can give us nine potential output, 14 or even 33 in the highest possible topology. So this excess energy is really important because that means that the binding now is no longer linear with the number of receptor or number of entity. Actually, it's a very nonlinear process. And this excess energy is fully entropic in large majority. And that means it's really much controlled by how we simply arrange our molecule rather than what molecule we use. And that is very interesting. Now, if we apply this knowledge to our problem of targeting, let's say, cancer cell opposite to normal cell, then I can plot the simple graph where I have my binding energy, if you like the affinity, now as a function of my number of receptor. My cancer cell, remember, I does express more, more receptor and then the rest of the cell does express less receptor. So what we want is targeting here, those guys here, and avoiding interaction with them. Now, if we select, however, our ligands that with the highest affinity, with really high energy, and when I talk about energy, I like to use as a reference is uh, the, the, the water hydrogen bond, right? The water hydrogen bond is about eight kT. One kT means thermal fluctuation. And then of course, one of the strongest no covalent bond ever uh, reported is the biotinavidin. And to, to give you an idea, that is around very close to 40 uh, kT. Now, a carbon carbon bond will be 300 kT, et cetera, but those energies are not something we are interested in with design drugs. Now, a high affinity means around between 10 to 20 kT. And, and that, of course, means that as soon as we have one receptor, we release enough energy to create a bounding. And then at the end of the day, I'm not mind you, this is a loss scale. Yes, there is a gain here when we target can can cancer cell, but really the, the difference between this state and this state is very, very minimal. Now things get a little bit better once we do multivalences, but still you have a lot of energy here in, the, in, in when you have one receptor. So effectively, even though you have a more energy release with a cancer cell, you still lose a lot of interaction here. Now, remember, when we target cancer cell, the one cancer cell corresponds to thousands or probably millions of normal cells. So this, this energy gain needs to be really, really big in order to get selected. But now if you remember how entropy nature of multivalences, and now instead of using an high affinity ligands, we go with a low affinity one, things become really interesting because of course the low affinity would be completely discarded because it has a very, very much no interaction whatsoever. Uh, you know, the, 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 the energy is really lower than the, the hydrogen bond. But if we combine a multivalent in the right way, then we can create some very interesting profile because we can get an energy that goes up with a number of receptor to the point after you get to the binding state when the number of receptor are above a certain threshold. And that is very exciting because effectively we create selectivity towards those cells and opposite to that, because in this, in this range, you have a zero interaction or very little interaction. And that really is kind of counterintuitive because in medicinal chemistry, typically we always look for the highest energy possible. Now, to complicate even further more the story, when we look at the ligand and receptor interaction, of course, this is, doesn't happen in, in a vacuum. It's, it, it, the biological world is a highly crowded environment. This animation shows a typical composition of a plasma, uh, so a block plasma, and they show you albumin, IgG, fibronectin, and many, and many other plasma protein in there. And actually, if you may, if, if you do the math, you, you'll find out that the plasma is about 10% of protein fraction. That accounts for a crowding like this, where the interparticle distance can go as low as 10 nanometer. So you don't really have a lot of space there to operate, which means if we look at our ligand receptor interaction in such environment, now, we can, of course, express this with a typical Leonard Jones potential. And then, of course, we will uh, we form a bond, which distance typically is uh, very close to each other. So you are sub nanometer distances when they form this complex. But using such a mathematical formula, however, it means that basically we account for nothing about the environment, how the particles interact with the environment. And, and actually, if we really go a little bit more uh, into uh, including that, in all the system interact with each other through some sort of mean field potential, which is not very specific. It's not just between ligand one and receptor one. 
is actually between everything else that's surrounded. And normally, this always inevitably means that you have a very strong steric, some sort of repulsion in a much for a, a larger scale. Now, how, how we can explain this, of course, this is a very simply explained using a borrowing tool from soft matter, in particular from colloids, uh, where object, colloidal object, uh, stability is expressed in terms of pairwise potential. Now, for example, if we look at the most abundant protein in the plasma, the albumin, of course, this is a charged protein, which is the hydrophobic hydrophobic domain. So, inevitably, interact within each other through a double layer interaction, of course, but also you're going to have a van der Waals, so you're going to have hydrophobic depletion and hydrophilic. So, effectively, each molecule will be repelling each other and creating some sort of a repulsion shielding potential, avoiding aggregation, because if that is not there, of course, all the molecules will collapse together. But that, that, that energy is always controlled by the environment. So hydrophilic hydrophobic interaction depend on water, double layer depend on the charge and of course the presence of ions. And then Van der Waals is intrinsic to the system, but then depletion hysteric also depends on how the system interacts with the rest. Now, when it comes to colloids, we know that if you want to stabilize your nanoparticle or your nano object in a liquid environment, you need to have that kind of surface stabilization, whether that is a charge on the surface, whether that is a polymer or a steric potential. And now, of course, it's interesting because effectively you have as always to overcome a, a repulsive barriers in order to have a specific interaction with fluids. Now, in protein, this has become even more complicated, and I'm not going to go into the into the into the electrostatic because we're not yet there in fully understanding how that works. But what we simplify the life is by looking at steric effect. In particular, proteins use a, a post translation modification to control the steric effect very effectively. In, indeed, many proteins get glycosylated. In other words, they react with sugars and they get decorated by in some cases, very, very long sugar chain. Amongst the most proteins, which are uh, famously uh, coated by, glyco, uh, by glycans, the glycoproteins are the most famous one and the proteoglycans. So the glycoproteins have uh, often many, many sites of glycosylation, which each of them encompasses a between 30, uh, up to 30 sugars attached in a dendritic fashion. Protoglycans, on the other hand, as the name says, are much more sugar than proteins, and indeed they present normally very, very long chain, up to hundreds of units of sugars attached to the protein. And so let me show you two examples of those. One actually very infamous example came from the current viral uh, pandemic, where the, the, viral, the, the protein associated with the, the, the SARS-CoV-2, the spike, is actually a glycoprotein, indeed. The orangey bit here is the protein, the protein is component, while the, all these components have the sugar attached into it. Uh, another one is this syndicate. This is a protein that's typically found in endophilia cells, and they coat the endophilia cell barrier, creating a very, very thick layer of sugar, sometimes hundreds of nanometer thick. A similar strategy is used also by bacteria. And so indeed, this system creates already some very intrinsic steric. Now, mind you, some of the sugar interact through specific potential interaction and their receptor for some of the sugar. But for the, for the sake of argument, allow me not to, 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 to discard them for the time being. And indeed, if we look at those sugar coating, now if we look at our receptor ligands interaction, now on top of the binding, we need to subtract the steric effect. Now, again, you can study the steric effect using polymer physics. And you can either have what is called the insertion type where the system really insert and push away the chain or a compression type where the, the system push and squeeze the chain. All of this can be somehow wor worked out to using polymer uh, physics, but beside the maths, what I want you to, to find out to, to a service that the energy now is an interaction, a combined interaction between a positive binding, sorry, a, a negative binding energy and a positive steric. What is really interesting, if we now put this together with multivalences, which I discovered, I, I introduced uh, to you before, uh, now, the total energy becomes quite fascinating when it comes to number of actor or number of receptor in play, at play. And indeed, as I showed you before, and this is kind of a simplified version of what I show you, the energy of binding is indeed proportionally an increase, uh, not linearly with the number of receptors. And typically, they, this, this behavior is like that. Now, on the other hand, sterics is, in the first approximation at least, 
is very much linear with the number of receptors. So the more this receptor ha we have, the more sterics we created. Now, if we then use a kind of a mean field argument here, what happens here if we put th to those two together in the presence of number receptor again, now we observe something really strange because yes, we have interaction, negative interaction, and negative energy means interaction up to a certain point. And then we reach, when we have too many receptors, too many ligands, after the interaction switch off, so even though this energy increases considerably, the, the steric increases even more. So effectively means that, that we have interaction only in a certain range of uh, a receptor uh, presented. Now, this is, can be better understood if we, instead of using energy, we're using a parameter called theta, which is space for the fractional bound party on a given surface. Zero means no interaction, one means saturation. That means that we have a very specific range of selectivity. To, to, to work with, right? And of course, I'm pretty sure most of you already switch off the audio because uh, those of you that are not interested in mathematics uh, might be completely alienated. Let me show you why this physics is important and uh, what we can do with it. Now, I already mentioned the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 as a good example of that. And this is a great example to show you this multivalence game because I told you already these, these, these viruses are highly glycosylated. So even though we can create in some lot of knowledge on those proteins, we need to remember that those proteins are completely sugar coated. So that means we have a lot of steric to play. On top of that, once they approach the membrane, they have other glycoprotein to overcome. Now you can also go into uh, to the biology of these viruses. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into much detail, but effectively you have many receptors that you have to interact with it. One of the most famous is the AC2, is the one that it was isolated for the SAR, uh, SAR the, the older SAR some years ago and now been demonstrated to work very well with the SARS-CoV-2. And that kind of taking a lot of interest in designing antivirals. But when it comes to really understand those interaction, now we need to account for the sterics. Because for example, if we look at the domain of the AC2 receptor involved in the, in the binding and the domain of the spike involved in the binding, already these guys have about four glycans and other two in there. So you do have a lot of sugars, which when it comes to human glycosylation, this sugar can be really complex and very long and big. And so inevitably we expect some sort of steric and inevitably we expect in something where the receptors actually, uh, if we follow our rules of what I call rate selectivity, that means actually the, 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 the assumption that the higher the number of the receptor, the higher the binding is absolutely completely wrong. And you do have this sort of sweet spot of interaction, which are co uh, dictated by the combination of the two. Now, if we then on, to on top of that, we add all the other receptor and core receptor associated with SARS, then we found the system is really complex. And indeed we have a kind of a energy map uh, interaction where you have a specific composition of those receptors, the green there here, where the binding happens and then beyond and, be and below those, there is no interaction whatsoever. So this is they make the system really complicated because of course using this then you can use proteomic data or single cell uh, single uh, single cell analysis genomic etc to really work out the tropism of the viruses and then as we do that of course this becomes a very important information because now we can map out how the virus is really diffused in the body and potentially replicate it completely using a synthetic surrogate that allow us to to really create a kind of selectivity the same as the virus. So this is what we call a stenotypic design. Now, how do we do phenotypic design? Of course, we use a, a very simplistic uh, biophysical model. I already kind of introduced this of the Langmihill equation where basically you assume the particle to be a multivalent system and the cell as a sign of a flat surface containing receptor. And, and so the binding, if I, re we show again the effect of multivalences and affinity in there can be represented, like I said, with this theta, zero non-interaction, one interaction completely. And then I, like I showed you before, a one already, I do get full saturation if I have too much high affinity, but then if I downgrade this affinity, then I can create a sort of beautiful super selectivity effect. So non-interaction in this range, and then all of a sudden you have a very quick buildup of interaction and then you saturate. So effectively you target a target cell. The problem with this theory, which actually was presented by a, a colleague in, in Cambridge, Dan Frankel, in 2011, is that when you do transform this into number, 
the energy is, is, is impossibly lost. In other words, the only way you can achieve this kind of super selective is with energy which are not existent in nature. So we have to came across with a solution. And then, of course, we know how to make steric uh, potential because that is an intrinsic component in, in making our nanopartial. When we make a polymer, so for example, this is the self assembling of this hydrophilic hydrophobic membrane. And then on the outer layer, you have this beautiful polymeric brush, which effectively creates a steric repulsion from protein. That makes the polymers very stable in a biological environment, extremely resistant to protein corona, but also allow us to really create some control on the steric by making sure that our ligand is are somehow embedded in that membrane. And that is a, a simple polymer chemist exercise because when we design our polymer, we can make it long enough when we have the feather that such, such as the, the system end up inside the brush. So now we create that kind of steric control. And then indeed we, 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 we fulfill that equation binding plus steric. And then something even more interesting is that if on top of steric and multivalence, we include multiplexing, now things become even more powerful because if we just simply, instead of target receptor one and receptor two, uh, and like with ligand one, we also include the receptor two and ligand two. Now we couple those interactions together. So the entropy gain becomes even more so. So to the point that now we can create a surface complementary game. It's effective we can create a ligand composition there that really match a very specific cellular population. And of course that what we call phenotypic targeting because as you know, those biologists in the audience, that phenotypes is very much the word to define the composition of those receptors on a given cell surface. And indeed, we can really combine this information to create some sort of very highly selective system. Right. Is it this something that can be applied in biology? Of course, we have to validate these theories. And uh, one of our favorite biological problems I already introduced to you is the blood band barrier. The blood brain barrier is very much the vasculature that feeds our brain. Our brain is a very unique organ. It's indeed, uh, even though 2% of body weight, it, has, it consumes more than 20, 25% of most nutrient, and in some cases, even 60%, like the glucose, uh, any, any sugar that you, you consume and produce in our body goes 60% of it in our brain. But it's also extremely privileged and completely isolated from the rest of the body with a lot of uh, control of what gets in and what gets out. Uh, and so indeed that is a quick ch a big challenge when it comes to pharmacology because designing drugs that get inside the brain is very difficult. Actually 99% of the not drugs do not enter the BVB um, for, for several reasons. But the BVB is made by endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells are those cells that make it vessels. So those vessels are identical in every part of our body. But because of the, the coexistence with the brain cells, then the brain cells convert those, those vessels into something different. And that phenotypic um, uh, programming, of course, is what we want to target using our, uh, our phenotypic design. So first of all, of course, you need to find out the markers. We, we found out that LRP1 and SRP1 are highly expressed by the endothelial cell. We also found out that the GLUT1, which is a glucose transporter, as a kind of uh, obvious uh, choice, is also overexpressed by the endothelial cell. Incidentally, we also serve those same markers are highly expressed by brain tumors, which are hiding behind the brain BVB, and that is an interesting observation. Now, if I focus on LRP1 and SRP1, what is the topology looking like of the ligands? This is a really big pro protein. LRP1 is a massive, very long stretch receptor, as long as the syndicate, remember those angry, angry uh, unit of sugars, and then the little SRP1 is this red dot here, um, let me let me ro rotate this again, uh, and now actually this is a reconstruction using the PDB data, so it's a very much in scale. So you see the relatively range, and that is a cell membrane to give you an idea. So we take this information and then we put it into our molecular engineering design. We creating a, a ligands that target LRP1. We work with a peptide called Angiopep. We create a ligands that target SRP1. We work with a polymer called uh, a polymethyl phosphoricholine, which we identified to have a very interesting interaction with this receptor. And then, of course, we uh, apply our multivalent design and then we test our theory by simply creating a, 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 an essay where we incubate our particle for a very short time, about an hour or half an hour, with different type of cells. And so, of course, we cannot really change the number of receptors, but by changing the cell, you effectively change the number of receptors. 
the beauty of the theory, however, is very symmetrical. So instead of charging the number of receptors, we can change the number of ligands. And so we titrate these different cell type using different number of ligands in our particles. And indeed, you start to observe this beautiful nonlinear behavior where the binding is kind of all of a sudden appearing as soon as you reach a number of ligands. So you see this with like angiopep uh, and ILAP1 or using brain endophilia and macrophage that are sent in the cells. You can do this with PMPC. And then actually in PMPC, it's interesting because the macrophage express more SRB1 than endophilia cell. So this is now a good ligand for BBB. However, it's still present, and I'm going to show you why the combination of the two. Now, you can convert this sort of binding assay into using our theta, you normalize them, and then you fit your experimental data using our theoretical uh, model. And, th and then when it works, what you get out of it is that a beautiful, uh, and not only you show that your theory kind of work, but also you get more information. You get information about the glycans. Uh, density, you'll get information about the receptor density, you get information about uh, binding if you don't have that, etc. Of course, this the more the more information you have, the more information you get, etc. So there is always a balance out. Now, the beauty of this approach, like I said, is when it becomes a multiplexed. So for example, if we now I titrate my binding using both angiopep ligands, so LRP1, and then PMPC, so SRB1 receptor. The combination of the two create a sort of multivalent, multiplex effect, and now I can get interaction at much high, lower level of uh, ligands or angiopep or at much lower levels of ligands of PMPC. Now, remember, with those, you were targeting macrophages, but now if we drop down to a minimum level where we don't have interaction with macrophages, and then we combine it with the LFP1 and then drop down even those to avoid even more specific interaction, then the combination of the two only works with brain endophilia more effective. So the selectivity increase of one order of magnitude by, by just simply combining those two. And that really is exciting because effectively means that we can personalize nanomedicine down to the single phenotype. And this is basically now an ongoing work in our lab, sorry, uh, where we have uh, created this kind of a workflow where we combine information for bioinformatics or proteomics, genomics, et cetera, into using our biophysical model and then, of course, validating this using experimental validation. Now, our model, as you, as you understand, is very simplistic. It's very much a thermodynamic uh, approximation. Now, we are working on the theory to push that into more so to including other aspects. But meanwhile, unfortunately for us, computational science has come up with solutions to solve our ignorance problem. And so what we are now trying to do is collecting enough data, and then we create a huge database here and then combine those with a model using machine learning algorithms that potentially can give us a very quick uh, solution. Now, that of course solve one problem, however, which is the targeting. So how we get to the brain endophilus, but that is not sufficient to get across the BBB. The BBB is, like I told you, this endophilus cell. So effectively what I'm doing there is I'm targeting these vessel walls here, but I, what I need to do is getting across. This is a, a, a confocal, an intravital confocal of a, of a mouse vasculature. This is a blood vessel in red, and then GFAP show the astrocyte, the glial cell, the neuron, uh, sorry, the, the brain cell behind the blood brain body. Now, getting across endophilia cell is actually not an easy task, but it actually seems quite trivial when you look at the electromicroscope micrograph of a single capillary, because what you found now, actually, these barriers, the BBB, is extremely thin. It's actually, in some cases, as thin as a few hundred nanometers. So how is that possible that you cannot get across? Now, one thing we need to understand that molecules that penetrate the BBB, even though they do that, they very quickly spat out, because the BBB express a lot of these ABC transporter that really a kind of work out almost with the most molecule and make sure that this molecule do not go across. So as soon as this molecule diffuse, then they get spat out again. Then it's very specific to certain molecules like glucose, for example, or some amino acid. And then he has uh, some very clever way to control transcytosis. Transcytosis is this process where the membrane is deformable on one side and then transported on the other side. And this is where we, we focus a lot of our attention in the last years. I'm trying, especially understanding whether this is a process that goes from blood to brain right away, or it goes through blood to endosome and then to the brain. And of course, to do so, we uh, implement again our sort of multisimilar approach. We go in silico model, we go in vitro model, and of course, we go animal models of the BBB. Now, in vitro, 
you can simply use this transfer system as a simplification where you grow your endothelial cells on one side of this porous membrane and then measure transport across. And again, by, for example, creating a lot of polymersomes with different ligands, then you find out that this non-linear behavior in the range where we get selectivity, not only you get selectivity, but only a very specific com uh, combination of ligands give you transport across. And that is very dramatic. It's like you go from orders of magnitude more or not interaction. And then you don't really need to have too many ligands. It's actually a really sweet spot. Now, this sweet spot is somehow understood by using very quickly modeling uh, algorithms. And then if we use a very simple model where we look at binding and binding on one side, transport and then binding and binding on one side, it shows you very quickly our system needs to bind, but yes, also needs to unbind. So it means if you have too much energy of binding, then your system gets stuck in this loop and come back so rather than going through. And while on the other side, if it's too little energy, you don't really get to start. So again, if you play with these two parameters, you find out a similar sweet spot. The beauty of this sweet spot in silico and in vitro is also replicated in vivo. Of course, in vivo, we cannot really test tens of formulation. We only test uh, three formulation. You have one ligand, here is 22 ligands, and this is uh, about uh, uh, 90 ligands. And then what you see there is some really nice effect of this kind of sweet, uh, sweet spot of uh, interaction here, where you really see almost 100 magnitude injected. This is measuring the concentration of the R polymers in the brain parenchyma, so beyond the capillaries, and then shows the really effectively how the materials get across. Now, this kind of sweet spot is even more it's even sweeter because actually not only is important to control the binding and the crossing, but it's also important in controlling how the membrane sort the materials. So with the help of Angela Salik here at UCL in the physics department, she's an expert in, in, in looking at simulation of large cells, including uh, you know, coarse graining as much as possible the interaction so that we can actually look at longer time frames as well as a collective effect. And what, what we should show uh, is that if you really look at the interaction in the cells as a function of the binding energy and receptive density, if you like, you found out that actually at high energy of binding, the particle is singly uptaken in the cell. So the energy of binding is so strong that it's, in, it's sufficient to deform the membrane singularly. While at low energy, of course, you have no interaction, but in the mid range, you get enough interaction for the particle to to stay stuck on the surface. And when they stay stuck, they become like a two-dimensional colloid and they start to assemble. And then as soon as they reach a critical number, they collapse and form this tubulation. And this is beautiful to look from a physical point of view, but even biologically, we've been able to prove exactly the same concept by doing very fast light cell imaging with brain endothelia. This is a single brain endothelial cell image from the top in 3D, in exact using a confocal scan in a very fast confocal. This is, is a nucleus, and then we have in red coming up our polymers and our particles. You see a lot of event in these videos, and now we can track them using a time labeling here. Basically, each color represents a, a single second. And so you see how many events happen in a single endothelial cell. It's quite hundreds of them. It's impressive how the cell is converting those. If we take one of each event and follow it all the way from the beginning to the end, we found out that at the beginning, you have a lot of dots happening on the surface, potentially binding the single particle. And then very quickly, these dots grow into cluster. But most important, this clustering is not just a 2D, it's also a 3D growth. So very quickly, we see this little tiny tubulation happening. This is really within the resolution of the confocal. But then nicely, these tubes grow and merge together and form this sort of really long and big sort of a transport to one side to the other. You, you can really calculate a lot of information using this lifestyle image, including the timing of casting, tubulation, fission, and crossing, et cetera. And then you can use super resolution to have a, a closer look at those tubular cluster. And by using STED, now we have about 20 nanometer resolution. It's a gated, uh, it's a gated time STED. Now we can reconstruct those tubes in time and in, in space with that resolution. And we found that something very interesting. Those tubes are completely cyclical. So they go up and down. So at some point, the, the, the binding happened and then they form those tubes, and then it, as soon as the tubes all the way go down, and then they happen again, but they are very symmetrical. There's always kind of an up and down game. So of course, having more particles on this side and this side, the net through it goes this way. But effectively, this system is actually kind of a lift that goes up and down. And then if you look at the detail of those tubular, you see they are very much the size of most of a single particles. 
and then they can be as long as to 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 host 10 or even five between five to 10 to 15 particle each tube but most importantly they never connect through they always form detach and fuse so there's never really a connection between the two layers of the cell so that is the biophysics from a biological point of view what does it mean of course there must be something that help in doing these things and actually we identify through a lot of screening a very important protein that does that is called syndapin 2 this is a bar domain protein that has a, uh, has the ability to assemble into tubular membrane it's like a bar a, a banana a broken the banana so you see the, the curve of the protein makes it such that the only stabilize tubular systems and then we we really observe that this protein is associated with our transport receptor and most important is associated with our polymer so with the right affinity ability numbers of uh, ligands and indeed in vitro we see really strong association with our polymers and the, and the syndapine and even more so in uh, in vivo we see that this is a literally the, the wall of a capillary this is where the blood goes and this is the brain and now in red in green is the capillary walls in red is our polymesomes and in blue is our syndapine and this is done with stead so with a resolution about 40 nanometer in vivo and, and indeed you see really this beautiful association of tubular structure here is the detail that show us after the same thing and like looking at these tubes out there now to conclude we have discovered yes you need a very specific interaction which is has to be multivalent but not too many ligands it has to be uh, not too strong because you don't really get across not, not only because you don't unbind on the other side but also because you don't deform the membrane in the right way and interesting we discovered that this is really much uh, mirrored by the cells so the endophilus cell has this ability of transporting materials in such a way it's a very unique process now what it happens is that if you look at the multivalence effect of this process not only you of course hijack this process and, and facilitate the transport what we discover is that if you start to play with multiavidity, for example, in LRP1 receptor, normally the LRP1 goes either back and forth or it goes into degradation. So this is a cycle our receptor. But now if we use the right multivalences, we push the tubulation. So our receptor is kind of forcing these pathways. And now if you look at the Western blot, it means after two hours incubation, the receptor goes up because what we're doing now is switching off the degradation. So we upregulate the receptor, at least in this time frame. On the other hand, if we use the, the, the high number of ligands where we actually push endocytosis, is the opposite happens in the very early time stage. We actually downregulate the receptor because we're pushing it down. So this this thing, so hijacking is never really a passive effect. You actually have an active effect, and that is important. Now, long story short, we can get stuff into the brain. In some cases, like in these platinum compounds, which is very easy to detect by fluorescence as well as by mass spec, we can get really high concentration of, of the drug in the brain compared to the rest of the body with really high selectivity of delivery. Of course, that means therapies. We already show you very quickly that we can use this uh, technology to, to treat stroke, for example, where we deliver a neuroprotective agent in, in an ischemic stroke and show that the delivery really helps in protecting the brain considerably for after the ischemic damage. We now apply this to glioma. In the glioma, I don't have the time, but the, the vascular is slightly different. And indeed we do target the glioma, but normally we actually end up targeting from the healthy vascular and the tumor vascular has a different type of things, but we, we're working on it. Long story short, we get our stuff into the, into the brain tumors. And of course, by combining this with the intracellular delivery, so our docs will be in our drug will become super effective and we can kill cells much faster and with less concentration. And now the preliminary data show a strong increase in survival in some of these animals. So I'm gonna finish off by acknowledging that actually this work has been possible because I've been extremely lucky to have uh, supervised and have joined forces with a a huge numbers of talent uh, individuals that at some point in in my time as an academic join me and allow me to supervise them in the work i i tried to put most of the people that came into my group here in this uh, in this collage and i show the people that are no longer in the group in, a, in black and white and the people that are current in the group are still in color uh, of course i need to thank the sponsor a lot of the work here I show you has been sponsored by EPSS, ERC, as well as the Severo Choa programs.
uh, and of course uh, the CREA that is now paying part of my salary and then of course the IBEC for the startup and then all the collaborators that I normally mention alongside the slide just because uh, sometimes you spend too much time uh, acknowledging and of course you all for the attention thank you very much <laughs>